Hey folks, and welcome to another episode in a video series presented by CoopaCon where I'll be exploring the Final Fantasy VII compilation lore and easter eggs that appear in the remake. I'm MJ Gallagher, author of the unofficial Final Fantasy VII novelization, the standalone novel The Nibelheim Incident, which is now an audio series also produced by CoopaCon, and the new book Norse myths that inspired Final Fantasy VII. The purpose of this series is to discuss a lot of the detail hidden within the remake, and to provide a broader understanding for new and veteran fans alike. In the last episode, I dissected Chapter 10, Rough Waters, covering Cloud, Tifa and Aerith's journey through the sewers below the Sector 6 and 7 slums. This time around, I'll be breaking down chapter 11, titled Haunted. The video will inherently include spoilers for this section of the game, but anything beyond chapter 11 is minimal and mainly speculation. However, as always, if you're not familiar with the original story, there will very likely be heavy spoilers. Following directly on from the sewer escape, Chapter 11 begins with the trio emerging in the train graveyard of the Sector 7 slums. They are immediately met by the sound of a helicopter flying overhead in the direction of the district's support pillar. It's revealed the B-09 craft is being piloted by Reno and Rude of the Turks, who we battled individually back in Chapter 8, and learn that the mission to bring down the plate has been authorised. Contrary to the cocky, ruthless attitude we saw of Reno at the Sector 5 church, he displays a degree of humanity here, voicing his disgust at the assignment. Though he does not vocally agree, Rud is also visibly conflicted by the order. This is in line with the characterisation of the pair, and most Turks, if truth be told, as they appeared in Before Crisis, the first compilation entry to be released after the original Final Fantasy VII. The old game depicts the Turks as heartless operatives who carried out Shinra's most heinous tasks, but Before Crisis examined the complexities of their beliefs and personalities and there is far more to these characters than simply being dangerous thugs. This was further supplemented by their roles in the official novels On the Way to a Smile and The Kids Are Alright, as well as Advent Children to an extent. Crisis Core also introduced another senior Turk, Cisne, who befriends Zack but is known to be surveying him as part of her personal assignment. Despite direct orders from Sung, she helps Zack and Cloud escape from the coastline in the Nebel region, which is another example of a Turk making a conscientious judgement call. As the remake progresses, we begin to catch glimpses of this side to Reno and Rude, which follows on from the latter's remark in Chapter 8 that he's not a bad person, he just sometimes has to do bad things. Though it appeared in the corresponding section of the original game, the train graveyard was nowhere near as sprawling. The loading screen information offers a little bit of detail on its past as a site utilised during the construction of Midgar, which suggests it functioned as a depot for materials being transported into the city, or even just between the old towns and the new plate before it eventually declined into a junkyard. Like the sewer network of Chapter 10, developers have expanded on this area enough to fill what is effectively an entire dungeon. The location is pretty distinct from anywhere else we've seen in the remake so far, and the floating mists have an eerie feel to them. Tifa goes on to provide a bit of context to the atmosphere, explaining that the people of the slums avoid the train graveyard, and there are urban legends that call this place haunted. 
There is even one story which says those who get lost out here will never find their way back home. Curiously, even Aerith, who we know can communicate with the spirits of those who have died and returned to the planet, seems visibly disturbed by the environment. I think it's great that there's a total change of pace and ambience in this chapter, and the creators have really intensified those creepy vibes, especially when Tifa begins hearing children. In an interview with Square Enix's North American team, co-director Motomu Toriyama went as far as to describe it as being like a haunted house attraction. What some compilation fans may have forgotten, however, is that the train graveyard was also used as a chapter setting in Dirge of Cerberus. During the World Regenesis Organization's assault on the ruins of Midgar, as defended by the deep ground soldiers, Vincent's deployment from the Shira airship is disrupted, and he ends up here. In Dirge of Cerberus, there is nothing haunting the train graveyard which I'll come back to later in the video, but it is overrun by deep ground operatives. There are even underground passages Vincent must enter and navigate from here, battling his way towards the central complex. So why have I brought up these tunnels? You may recall that I spoke way back in my episodes covering chapters 3 and 4 of the remake of references that were made by Weimar and a group of civilians in Sector 7 to some secret laboratories beneath the slums. I don't wish to spoil too much at this time, but the game's Ultimania has confirmed that these laboratories are part of Deep Ground. Therefore, based on the area of the train graveyard explored in Dirge of Cerberus, we can speculate that an entrance to the facility may be located somewhere around here. This would explain A, how the people of the slums accessed their so-called secret reactor jobs, as mentioned in chapter 4, B, Tifa's story about people being lost and never returning, and C, just how so many deep ground troops are able to quickly emerge to challenge Vincent during his time here. There is actually one other compilation entry where the train graveyard shows up, and that is in the short novella, Picturing the Past, written by Kazushige Nojima and included in the remake's World Preview book. I spoke about this novella in my episodes covering Chapter 8, specifically how it provides an explanation for who the cloaked, tattooed figures are. The unnamed narrator of the story is searching for a scientist he knew in his childhood but the man went missing 15 years ago as part of Shinra's special survey unit. It transpires that the unit were sent on secret assignments to locate areas around the planet where Mako was thought to be plentiful. Almost all of those who returned had suffered serious Mako poisoning and were later subjected to experimentation by Professor Hojo, undoubtedly something relating to Genova cells. Anyway, the narrator meets a woman called Joanne, who is the carer for one of the cloaked figures, Liliza. As it happens, the narrator had witnessed Liliza trying to attack a young Aerith at Shinra Laboratories years earlier, because she blamed the girl's Cetrin visions for her own deteriorating condition. During one chapter of the novella, Joanne and the narrator follow Eliza into the train graveyard, where she gathers with the other survivors of the special survey unit. It's hinted that this is a kind of mini reunion, and though this is nothing more than mere speculation, their instinctual convergence above a covert soldier facility where immoral Genova cell testing is being conducted does raise a few questions. Arriving outside the maintenance facility, some spooky glowing images materialise and the doors begin to part. Tifa is understandably apprehensive about venturing inside, but Aerith grabs Cloud's arm 
and insists that her bodyguard will protect them, which is yet another callback to chapter 8. Tifa is compelled to do the same, creating a visual representation of the infamous love triangle between the three. If you look closely, Aerith even uses this opportunity to rest her head on Cloud's shoulder. As you enter the derelict facility itself, there is more creepy laughing and Aerith spots one of the ethereal blue flames disappear behind some containers. She approaches the site, claiming to have found the culprit, and a ghost reveals its true form to the trio. It's the spirit of a young boy, and Aerith seems calm in speaking with him. This should be another little reminder to veteran fans that she has experience in communicating with the dead. One such example would be Elmira's husband, who was killed during the Wutai War many years ago, which Aerith sensed before her adoptive mother was officially notified. The ghost soon takes on a more tangible form, similar to that of the old game, but is suddenly attacked by another. This may seem incidental at first, but it actually lays the groundwork for an important concept that I'm going to revisit in the next episode. I won't say any more about it now, but the concept relates to the ghosts having different agendas. Aerith thereafter prevents Cloud from attacking the ghost with a distinct teardrop, and as it flies upwards and vanishes, a black shadow emerges shifting one of the suspended train carriages along the crane's rails overhead. As the three watch in horror, the entire car is dislodged and dropped on them, but they escape uninjured. Not only does this scene act as a mechanism to create a detour for the party, it helps explain how and why so many of the carriages around the graveyard are in precarious positions. There is unquestionably something supernatural going on in the train graveyard, and anyone who played the original Final Fantasy VII may recall the ghost enemies could also be fought in the corresponding section, capable of vanishing and reappearing mid-battle. In order to ascertain exactly what these ghosts are, however, I have to delve into some pretty abstract compilation lore. Just as it did back in 1997, their existence presents a curious question about the metaphysics of the Final Fantasy VII universe. Compilation fans will by now be very familiar with the concept of spirit energy and the lifestream. To briefly summarise, the lifestream is the great swell of all spirit energy and is quite literally the lifeblood of the planet. A single strand of spirit energy can be equated to a soul, allocated to an individual when they are born, and which rejoins the livestream when they die. So how then do these ghosts fit into that system? Are they fully dead? Are they part of the physical or spiritual world? Or are they perhaps just a special type of monster? Well, there are actually a few examples of similar entities in the compilation. The Phantoms of the Gee Tribe at Cosmo Canyon are probably the best instance, and I'll come back to them in a minute. But there is also the famous disappearing spirit of Aerith at the Sector 5 church, when the player first returns to Midgar in the old game. The remnants of Sephiroth in Advent Children, Kadaj, Laws and Yazoo, who are willfully formed from the negative livestream. And of course the mysterious hooded spectres that are somehow connected to fate and have already appeared several times in the remake. There is another specific example however which provides a bit more context to the ghosts haunting the train graveyard. In the original Final Fantasy VII, the player will encounter hovering pumpkin-like beings at Shinra Manor called Dorky Faces. These enemies actually play a role in episode 13 of Before Crisis, 
where they are presented as floating balls of blue flame in the darkness. It's only when the player Turk turns on the lights that they are revealed to be dorky faces. During the episode, Chief Ferdo explains that these entities are associated with death, likening them to Hitodama of Japanese folklore. Hitodama are effectively souls of the dead that have separated from their bodies. It can't be a coincidence then that the undisturbed spirits of the train graveyard are depicted the same way, as a blue flame floating in the darkness. As the group later makes their way through the second floor offices of the facility, Tifa quotes the old urban legend again and begins to ponder what would have happened if she and the others had been caught and trapped here by the ghosts. Aerith responds by proposing that they may have it backwards, that perhaps the ghosts are the ones who are trapped. As I touched on before, there is actually a precedent for this type of scenario in the original Final Fantasy VII. When Bugenhagen leads Cloud and Nanaki into the caverns beneath Cosmo Canyon, we learn that the vengeful spectres of the Gi tribe still linger there, having perished during the battle in which Nanaki's father, Seto, defeated them single-handedly. Bugenhagen describes the phantoms as being too filled with hate and anger for their spirit energy to diffuse into the life stream, and so they have remained on the physical plane. Anyone who has played Final Fantasy X, also created by Yoshinori Kitase, Tetsuya Nomura, Kazushige Najima, and Motomu Toriyama, may note that this description is similar to fiends, which are effectively unfulfilled souls who have not yet been sent to the far plane and have eventually become monsters. It has long been speculated due to creator comments in the Final Fantasy VII Ultimania Omega and a vague affirmation by Katasi himself in 2017 that this world and Spira of Final Fantasy X actually share the same universe. If so, one could argue that these ghosts are behaving like unsent fiends. Anyway, getting back to my point, the spectres of the Gi tribe are an unusual case in terms of the metaphysics of Final Fantasy VII. During the livestream white mini chapters of the official novel On the Way to a Smile, Aerith makes it very clear that some of the souls who join the livestream are already angry and not yet willing to accept their fate. Such strands of spirit energy are susceptible to Sephiroth's influence and run the risk of joining the negative livestream instead. So what's the difference between these angry souls and the vengeful warriors of the Gi tribe who haven't entered the livestream at all. One theory points to the existence of the Gi in attack, the undead chief of the clan, whose grip on the physical plane may be so strong that it provides a focal point for the others, or may even prevent them from passing on. As we'll soon discover in this chapter of the remake, the so-called Black Wind works in a similar way. After negotiating the blocked routes in the maintenance facility, the three encounter the spirit of a female child. Note the image of the teardrop ghost that materialises here. As the camera moves between Aerith and Tifa, we see that the latter has been presented with a vision of Marlene. We know from the original game that Marlene is safe at this moment, indicating that Tifa is interacting with an illusion. According to episode 13 of Before Crisis that I mentioned earlier, illusions are the speciality of dorky faces, thus creating another parallel between the pumpkin-like fiends and the ghosts of the remake. The vision causes Tifa to recollect a memory from Seventh Heaven where Barrett's daughter is warning her to stay away from the train graveyard and the Black Wind, which she says abducts children. During the scene, Marlene grows sad and asks when her daddy is coming home. It's unclear if this is the same night as the Mako Reactor 1 bombing, 
but it gives us a glimpse of the impact Barrett's avalanche activism has on Marlene. Elmira challenges him about this in the original game, though exploring it from Marlene's perspective is new to the remake, and acts as a stark reminder of the personal sacrifices and conflicts that are made, or enforced, by the characters. As a side note, there's also a specific reason Tifa has experienced a memory filled with sadness here, but I'll come back to that. While I was admittedly surprised by its inclusion, it was nice to see that the little puzzle section of shunting the locomotives has made a comeback for the remake. Once the train has lurched to a stop however, the radio crackles to life and the party overhears a transmission between Sung and Reno. Aerith lowers her eyes at this, because while the Chief of the Turks has not yet been introduced in the remake, she is all too familiar with him, so hearing his voice in this context has further stirred her emotions. I touched on their complicated relationship in my first Chapter 8 video, but I'll discuss it further in the next episode. Nevertheless, having the Turks verify their plans to drop the plate still comes as a terrible shock to Tifa. As the trio progresses towards the pillar, they encounter a Cerulean Drake and Lesser Drake near a set of movable locomotives. You may recall way back in Chapter 3 that there are two separate side quests available to the player which require the extermination of some drakes in the abandoned Talliger factory. The NPC quest givers confirm that the dragons have flown in from the train graveyard and have taken up residence in the factory, so the skirmish here is a callback to that. The creatures actually show up in the original as well, just by the name of Dean Glow. I've spoken at great length already about what the ghosts of this area likely are, but not about what they want. Our first real introduction to this occurs in a couple of the rooms on the second floor of the maintenance facility, where Aerith takes a few seconds after entering to look around. She will pick particular spots and announce she has found someone, only for the player to be thrust into a skirmish with more ghosts. What's curious here is that the flower girl's little searches are done in a deliberately playful manner. Similarly, when the spirits bombard the party with items in the control room, Aerith quotes them as saying, coming to get you, as if this is a game, albeit a pretty violent game. The ghosts start acting hostilely towards Cloud, Tifa and Aerith, then merge to become a monstrous ghoul. The ghoul does battle with the three, initially in a form that's oddly reminiscent of the unknown three opponent, itself found aboard the sunken Gelnica plane in the original Final Fantasy VII. At the end of the encounter, Aerith converses with the dissipating entities, which seem to tell her that this whole time they just wanted someone to play with. Her words confuse Cloud, but the reason is explained towards the end of the chapter. Before the group can escape the train graveyard, Aerith is swept away by the black wind, and finds herself in another part of the compound surrounded by ghosts. The one with the teardrop is again present, and approaches her. As the camera pans around though, we see distinct blue and orange images on its back of a cloaked figure and something being driven. Sure enough, the ghosts soon vanish and a hooded being with an illuminated death mask materialises in their place from within the black wind. This is Eligor, a reimagined foe from the original Final Fantasy VII, who has taken on a more substantial role in the remake. Aerith begins to see the spirits of young children playing around her, and it becomes clear that the ghosts of the train graveyard are indeed the kids who have been abducted by the Black Wind. Furthermore, the game they are playing is Hide and Go Seek, which is exactly why Aerith played along in finding them 
in the maintenance facility. It transpires that what the girl is envisioning is not the present, but in fact a memory of her childhood. As mentioned earlier, Aerith is known to communicate with the dead, so it makes sense that she would have played with ghost kids in her youth. This scene however depicts Aerith being cut off from the others and is left feeling very alone, calling out for her mother. As we learn in the original, Aerith's birth mother, Ifalna, died when she was around this age, so the sense of loneliness and abandonment is really driven home by how much it upsets the flower girl. Like Tifa's recollection of Marlene, Aerith too has now experienced a memory filled with sadness. On an unrelated topic, young Aerith is shown to have a pink bow in her hair, identical to the one she wears in the present. This is actually a retcon from Crisis Core, because chapter 5 in that game has Zack purchased this bow for her from Central Slums to celebrate their one day anniversary. Prior to this, her bow was pale blue, while she wears a red one during episode 11 of Before Crisis. When Cloud and Tifa rescue Aerith from the memory, Eligor fully emerges from the Black Wind to engage them in battle as the end of Dungeon Boss. Like I said before, Eligor's role in the remake has been expanded and he has even been given his own little bit of in-game lore by the creators. In addition to the story of the Black Wind abducting children and trapping their spirits in the train graveyard, co-director Motomu Toriyama revealed in the same interview I spoke of earlier that Eligor has the ability to foresee events. Specifically, the Ghastly Fiend can sense the imminent collapse of the Sector 7 plate and the deaths of thousands of civilians, knowing that this will cause a significant disturbance in the livestream. As such, both in dropping the train on them in the maintenance facility and inviting them here, he is actively working to stop Cloud, Tifa and Aerith from reaching the pillar on time. And the lore surrounding Eligor is not limited to the Final Fantasy VII universe either. In the original game, the monster's design was very similar to how it appears here, a masked figure riding a hellish creature that was half horse, half chariot. In The Lesser Key of Solomon, a medieval book concerning Christian demonology, Eligor, also known as Abigor, is a Grand Duke of Hell, often described as a handsome man on a horse wielding a lance, but occasionally he is depicted as a cloaked spectre riding a semi-skeletal steed. He is also able to see the future and commands legions of demons or evil spirits. And just in case that wasn't enough to explain where the remake's developers drew their inspiration from, one of Eligor's attacks in the game is the Winds of Gehenna. According to the Hebrew Bible, Gehenna was a cursed valley where some of the kings of Judah had previously sacrificed their children. In other texts, Gehenna is likened to a sort of purgatory for wicked souls, or, as in the Kabbalah, a waiting area for all those who have died but not yet passed on to the afterlife. All this, of course, reflects the spirits of dead children being trapped in the train graveyard, stuck somewhere between the physical world and the life stream. Incidentally, the name of the attack can be compared to the Reigns of Gehenna, an extra mission from the international version of Dirge of Cerberus, where Vincent takes on deep ground soldiers in a valley. And why is this worth mentioning? because it brings us right back to the connection between Deep Ground and the Train Graveyard. In terms of the boss himself, Eligor is the only enemy in the entire game from whom a weapon can be stolen. This is the bladed staff for Aerith, which is quite separate to the lance wielded by the monster. It's also a bit of an easter egg, because the player could also steal Aerith's striking staff from Eligor in the old game. And if you hit the menu button during the fight, 
to bring up his details. You'll see that they describe him as a fiend that feeds on human fear to grow stronger, and that he is a manifestation of the memories and sorrows that linger in the train graveyard. This is exactly why I highlighted the memories and sadness experienced by Tifa and Aerith, because it would seem the illusions were conjured by Eligor to empower himself. When the boss is finally defeated, Tifa gazes towards the pillar, where her avalanche and neighbourhood watch friends are resisting the Turks. Spurred on by this, she rushes Eligor and unleashes her somersault limit break, yelling for him to go to hell. This is an interesting phrase because, as I discussed back in my episode covering the events at the Sector 5 church, the concepts of heaven and hell shouldn't exist in this world, as knowledge of the livestream is relatively accessible. Nevertheless, the terms have been used multiple times across the compilation. An exception should be made in this case, however, because again, in demonology, Eligor is a Grand Duke of Hell, so it's a clever little reference the creators have included. And finally, with the Black Wind's hold over them released, the ghosts of the train graveyard begin to dissipate into the livestream. The visuals for this are similar to how Kadaj does so in Advent Children, after he has been beaten by Cloud and showered by Aerith's healing rain. The group is again approached by the ghost with the teardrop, who seems to be saying farewell. Though it isn't explicit in the remake, I think the markings of the cloaked figure and mount on this particular ghost, not to mention its appearance before both girls' illusions, and the train being dropped to block their way in the maintenance facility, indicates it is connected to Eligor. Perhaps he was trying to guide the group to challenge the fiend. Perhaps he was a part of Eligor that wanted to be set free. Food for thought. Anyway, circling briefly back to other parallels drawn earlier in the episode, the whole scene is pretty reminiscent of a summoner sending in Final Fantasy X, with the souls being sent to the far plane. And as for why there are no ghosts in the train graveyard when Vincent passes through during Dirge of Cerberus, this provides quite a definitive answer. Well guys, this has been my recap of the compilation lore and easter eggs from chapter 11 in the Final Fantasy VII Remake. I hope you've enjoyed it, and please be sure to leave a comment with any feedback or something you think I've missed. If you haven't already done so, I invite you to check out my own Patreon account, where you'll find free downloads of my unofficial novelization of Final Fantasy VII, The Nibelheim Incident, and so much more. Subscribers also get access to a huge amount of original content as well, including project artwork, behind the scenes podcasts, or mythology and Final Fantasy articles, etc. And please consider picking up a copy of my new book, Norse Myths That Inspired Final Fantasy VII, which is on sale now. But until next time, take care. I'm MJ Gallagher, in association with Kupacon, and I'll speak to you again soon.